Brisbane was the state capital of Queensland and the third biggest city in Australia in 1942. Many people thought it was more like a big country town than a city, though, because the 340,000 people who lived there lived in a quiet, conservative, and remote way. Nobody stayed, and not many people came to visit. After that, the Americans showed up. The location of the city center and the fact that General Douglas MacArthur's offices were there drew thousands of American soldiers there. There were also Australian troops, known as diggers. As the war went on, more and more of them came to fight, and Brisbane got bigger to accommodate them. By November 1942, it was a city with bases. It was no longer even Brisbane. The name given to it by the U.S. High Command was Base Section 3. It was not the Japanese who most of the soldiers there saw as their enemy. It was boredom. Idleness was always there with them. Hotel doors were only open for three hours a day, and movie theaters were closed on Sundays. People always knew when the few movie theaters in the city were open because the lines to get in were several blocks long. There weren't many hotel sessions because there wasn't much booze and there wasn't enough entertainment for all the people who wanted it. A lot of the people who lived there were also very angry, especially the Australian soldiers who had just come back from fighting in the Middle East. They quickly came to the conclusion that the Americans had pretty much taken over their town, both physically and socially. It looked like most of the women, both single and married, were with guys who were well-groomed and wealthy. The diggers were still upset about things like pay, clothes, food, and what they saw as unfair treatment. They were fighting the same enemy overseas. But here, tensions between the Allies rose and violence got worse. Between April and October 1942, 1,032 American soldiers were charged with mischief crimes. The Australian counterpart was probably about the same in terms of proportions. A lot of things happened that needed the attention of the police and sometimes the coroner's office. At that time, the press was highly censored, so most people didn't know much about serious crimes. The local media said it was bad for Americans to carry knives. Mason Turner, the U.S. consul, told the State Department that there was a lot of hostility toward Americans. In fact, he said that things were so bad in some parts of Queensland that some Australians and Americans would rather kill each other than the Japanese. In Brisbane, Lieutenant Colonel Harry H. Vaughn, who was the Provost Marshal of the American troops, said that in November, his military police units broke up 20 fights every night. In some southern cities, things were the same. Colonel Ann Kemsley told a co-worker in Sydney that letters um, intercepted from different areas revealed that GIs had considerable ill feeling towards Australian servicemen. It was clear that the two groups had different points of view. For the Australians, Major General J.M.A. Durant, who was in charge of the troops in Queensland, saw the bad mood as anger at the first claim on accommodations, food, and luxuries that, for better or worse, they believe is accorded to U.S. personnel because their spending power is so much greater than the Australians. The problem of U.S. troops and local women was also brought up. Durant talked about the behavior of a large section of women folk who allowed themselves to be literally mauled about in public, irrespective of the time and place. This feeling made British soldiers in England dislike Americans even more. The situation wasn't any better because the Americans thought they were above the law in the host countries. From 1942 to 1943, the number of divorces in Brisbane alone went from 100 to almost 400. About 200 of these were thought to involve cheating, with Americans being responsible for a third of them. There must have been a huge number of broken weddings, vows, and hearts while people were still together. During the war, there is no question that Brisbane was the place where allies went to fall in love. Out of the 15,000 marriages between American service members and foreigners, 5,000 took place at Base Section 3. At least half of the members were not fit for police work because they were frequently drunk, unreliable, physically weak, or different in build and mental development. 
people in both Australia and the United States disliked and even hated most levels of government. The military police, who were sometimes called provosts, were seen as the enemy of many of them. With almost 100,000 service members in the city, it was impossible for the civilian government to keep law and order. The military had to take over. By the end of 1942, there were over 800 active members of the American Provost Corps in Brisbane and 110 active members of the Australian Provost staff in the same area. In November, the 814th and 738th eight MP battalions were in charge of maintaining law and order in the U.S. military. They were stationed at Winstains, which was just a short distance from the city center and where the Australian and American canteens were. It was the favorite hangout for all soldiers. The provosts were in charge of keeping order and acting as guards on docks and buildings. It was unclear whether the people in the 738th Battalion were fit to do their jobs. In the official history of the Provost Marshals section, it says, at least half of the members were not fit for police work because of drinking habits, not being reliable, physical weakness, physical build, and mental development. Some early war historians have said, it is probably a fair generalization to say that in the United States, the display of batons and firearms by police is an effective way to quell a riot, whereas in Australia, it is an effective way to start one. This is because most provosts were armed and hostile. People shouldn't treat the military cops with respect but they should be careful around them. As he looked for his customer outside of a U.S. camp in Sydney, a cab driver was shot and killed. When two sailors from Australia got into a fight over a salt shaker, the provost killed the sailor. An argument with the provost led to the death of another Australian sailor. The provost knelt down and shot two 45 caliber rounds into the injured sailor's chest. These and other terrible events have one thing in common. During the heat of the moment, a gun ended the fight. These men would not have died if they did not have guns. The Australian provosts, who were smaller in number, only carried a baton. The Americans, on the other hand, carried a holstered 45 caliber automatic, which was a very powerful weapon. A lot of the time, the guns made things worse instead of better. Also, the two cultures clashed because one country had been built in part on guns, while the other was lucky enough not to have had to rely on guns because of its location. Science. Tensions were rising between provosts, soldiers, and citizens in Brisbane, which was dark, crowded, and depressing. This made it seem like a day of reckoning was coming. The fight between American and Australian soldiers, which became known as the Battle of Brisbane, shocked many but did not surprise many. The event was barely talked about at the time and it has only been talked about occasionally since then. Most people can't remember. Some people will never forget. Now that we look back we can see how important the fight was. This was the biggest and most violent fight between allies during the war. It also played a big role in proving Brisbane's guilt and affected how the friendship between the two allies changed over time. Fate put a company of the 738th MP Battalion in Base Section 3 on November 26, 1942, with a few thousand soldiers who were ready to have fun. Everyone in Brisbane was going about their normal business on a nice summer day. But just before noon, an American MP tried to stop a fight on Albert Street, which was a sign of things to come. A digger's head was hit with a stick which made other people come to the scene, there was some peace again after a short but fierce fight. Still, a lot of people thought the government was losing control. At 6.30 p.m., the hotels had closed for the second time that day. As usual, the streets were full of aimless soldiers and citizens looking for something fun to do as it got darker. Individual James R. Stein, 404th Signal Company, United States Army, was about to cause one of the most well-known events of the war in the home front by accident. Stein had been in the Australian kitchen. No one knows with whom or why he was there, 
but he was drinking. Since he was leaving the canteen, he began to walk toward the American PX canteen, which was not far away. Stein ran into three diggers who were also drunk on his way to the PX. If two soldiers ran into each other at that time, they would either talk or fight. At first, there was talk in this case. A friendly conversation between allies was going on at the same time that one or two American MPs may have shown up. Without a question, Private Anthony E. O'Sullivan of the 814th MP Company asked Stein for his leave pass. No one is sure who landed the first hit. There was swearing, a baton was raised, blows were struck, boots and fists hit each other, and then the three diggers turned into ten, then twenty. Regular people also came. There were whistles from everywhere and more MPs showed up, most of them from the PX. It became too dangerous for the MPs to stay where they were, so they went to the PX. Stein also walked in. As soon as O'Sullivan was brought inside, the doors were quickly locked and closed. Right away, there were alarms and frantic phone calls. There were a lot of people outside, and soon rocks, sticks, and bottles were being thrown at the kitchen. At 7.15 p.m., First Lieutenant Lester Duffy from the 814th arrived. Afterward, he said, about a hundred Australian soldiers were struggling to break through a makeshift cordon around the PX door. They were yelling at the jerks from the United States to leave, or they would come in. One of the first people from the government to arrive at the scene was Police Inspector Charles Price. Price said, The crowd was getting bigger, quickly. They were yelling and hooting, Take down the bloody building, come out and fight, you used the battens on our friends, but you ran away at Milna Bay. Civilian police were lined up across the door, backed by U.S. military police, said Captain Robert M. Wise, an American contact officer who watched from the balcony of the nearby Gresham Hotel. Green-clad troops would gather in front of the door and rush it every once in a while. I could see nightsticks being used, and there was a lot of fighting. Around 2,000 to 4,000 people were involved in the melee by 8 p.m., and it didn't look like it would end anytime soon. As the fight moved to other streets, women workers were told to leave the area and were led out by guards. In the PX, Private Stein tried to get his leave pass from Private O'Sullivan's pocket while he was on the ground. Stein's name is erased from history with the words, I was told to forget about the pass. I stood in line with the other guys and helped them out after someone gave me a club. Both sides' military police put up fences around the area and stood guard with the civilian police. A lot of cars were turned around by armed men. There were people who were just interested and people who wanted to join in. In his memory, Duncan Caporn holds a small truck driven by an Australian soldier and three men. Guards caught the four people after finding four Owen submachine guns, many boxes of ammo, and a lot of hand grenades. By 8 p.m., the fight, which didn't seem to be getting better, was thought to have between 2,000 and 4,000 people involved. The protests couldn't be stopped when the fire department showed up, but either couldn't or wouldn't train their hoses on the crowd. The Americans would be very angry about this loss. We have no plans to use our services to stop riots in the military or in the streets. The overworked fire chief said soon after the event, our job is to put out fires. Some Australian MPs took off their armbands and joined the crowd while others tried to calm them down. Soldier Norbert Grant from Company C, 738th MP Battalion, wasn't even in the city when the fight began. He was lying in Musgrove Park in South Brisbane and reading a book. He left at 7 p.m. It was too dark to read, and everyone knew there was a fight in town. It wasn't just any fight, it was a real brawl. Grant thought it would be best to show up early for work. He had just walked through the door to the barracks when he was given a Stevens Pump Action 12-gauge shotgun. It is a rage gun that can fire 30 pellets at a time. It is a real peacekeeper and very dangerous up close. Then Grant was told to go to the PX with the others because there is a hell of a riot and our boys are getting hurt. 
A lot of responsibility was shown by the Australian and American MPs and civilian cops by not using guns up to this point. Private O'Sullivan did the right thing by not pulling out his gun when he was being beaten up. So far, the only things that were used to put down the riot were bottles, sticks, fists, boots, and anything else that was handy. That's how long it took Norbert Grant and the rest of C Company to get to the fight. They soon had to elbow, push, and stomp their way through the crowd to get to the PX where Americans were afraid they would be killed. Outside, they could see tens of thousands of soldiers, citizens, and Australian government and military officials. Outside, armed guards stood at the pickets and tried to calm down the crowd. Civil police were working hard to keep people safe, and some of them were also talking to the crowd. Later, the police said that the armed pickets didn't do anything. Some left, some joined the crowd, and a lot of them did nothing. As Grant pushed his way toward the PX, he saw a sea of angry people. He thought to himself, Jesus Christ, I'm going to get killed tonight. An hour after reading a book in Musgrove Park's peaceful atmosphere, Private Norbert Grant was about to become famous forever. Look, someone yelled, one of those jerks has a gun. All of a sudden, they all came for me and I had my back to the wall of the PX. I threatened them with the gun and told them to break it up, Grant told the court of inquiry that followed. A soldier from Australia got close to me, so I hit him with it. Then, while I was leaning against the wall, they grabbed the front of the gun and another man grabbed my neck. That's when the gun went off. The gunshot was heard. There were three shots. Grant could only think of firing one. The first one hit Private Edward Webster of the Two Halves Anti-Tank Regiment and broke his chest. He was already dead when he hit the ground. Sergeant Kenneth Hankel hurt his cheek and wrist when he fell. PVT um, Ian Tiemann hurt his chest when he fell. And PVT Frank Corey hurt his leg. Private Walter Maidment was only 18 years old when he was hurt in battle in his own city's street. To make matters worse, Private Richard Ledson, who is 35 years old, was shot in the left thigh and hand and broke both ankle bones. One person, 38-year-old Joseph Hanlon, was shot in the leg and Sapper DeVasso was shot in the hip. There were screams and yells and then there was a short pause. After scrambling off the path and running toward the PX, Grant hit an Australian in the head with the barrel of a shotgun. The Australians were really mad at Private Joseph Hoffman, an American soldier who was guarding one of the PX doors. His head was broken. Some people called it the Battle of the Canteens. And it went on pretty much nonstop from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. In the end, it went away. As the fireworks went off, the crowd thinned out and the ambulances came. The lower part of the PX was broken. Litter and broken glass were left over from the fight. Given how bad the riot was, the number of deaths was pretty low. One Australian was killed, eight were hurt by gunshots, six were hit with batons, and hundreds more had black eyes, swollen cheeks, split lips, broken noses, and other injuries. Eight MPs were hurt. At 11 p.m., the chief censor's office in Brisbane told all three states that they could not broadcast or cable news about the Brisbane riot. Tough control made things worse in Brisbane and all over Australia. As there were no official facts, there were a lot of rumors. People accused the Americans for everything. 10 or 15 diggers were killed when the Americans shot or machine gunned the crowd. Some people died from being hit with batons. Someone was hit by a car and left to die. People talked about getting even and getting revenge. Divers ventured into the city on November 27th in groups to look for Americans and cause trouble. Luckily, trouble was seen coming and some safety measures were taken. Both canteens were locked up and dozens of armed soldiers were stationed at the watch lines. It's not always the PX or the American MPs that the Australian packs were out to catch. Any American in uniform did it. Aussies were beating the living crap out of every American they could find. Service members on both sides could have kept things calm if they had stayed at their bases. A lot of people were still walking the streets, though. As it got darker outside, a lot of people collected in front of the American Red Cross building. The area around the PX had been locked down, 
Hand grenades were taken away by NCOs in the crowd, who then tried to find their men and get them out of the area. It was a tricky position. A lot of American MPs were armed and ready to fight on the first floor. A large group of people broke up and then came back together at the corner of Queen and Edward Streets in front of General MacArthur's office and yelled insults at him. The mob was spending time because the general was on a rare trip to the front in New Guinea. American warrant officer William A. Benson worked in MacArthur's headquarters and saw both sides of the fight. He remembered the trouble on Friday night. I had just left barracks and was on my way to work at headquarters. When I got to Queen Street, it looked like nothing was going on. There were people everywhere. The Aussies were kicking the living crap out of any American they could find. I sped down a lane and ran for headquarters because it didn't look good. They were not regular AIF troops. The Aussies were in the militia. The band on their hats let me know this. There were between 300 and 600 people, so there couldn't have been more than 300. I saw what was going on from the sixth floor of HQ. Three groups of people formed in the crowd and they were punching and kicking Americans in dress as they went over their heads and into the groups. The Australians were only able to find 21 Americans. They beat them up and took them to the hospital. I had a lot of friends get beat up at GHQ. The next morning, some of them came to work with their arms in slings and black and blue marks all over their bodies. When 20 U.S. provosts and a group of diggers waving stolen batons met in Queen Street, the chances of something bad happening went up. The Americans stood in a line and pulled out their 45 automatics from their belts. An unknown Australian officer saved lives by telling the American leader to put his men in a truck and drive away. It's possible that the war would have happened in the streets of Brisbane instead of the jungles of New Guinea if the provost had shot the Australian troops. On the second and last night of the fight, 21 people were hurt and 11 of them were taken to the hospital. They were all American. There were eight MPs and four soldiers in the group. After two days, steps were taken the next day to make sure that the same thing wouldn't happen again. Moving units that were important in the war, making the MP stronger, closing the Australian canteen, and moving the American PX were all changes that were made. Almost right away, an investigation started. The Americans said that the act happened because the Australians were having an affair that had nothing to do with them. The Australian government said that their troops were to blame for what happened but they also said that the American provost should learn how to be polite and calm. Authorities at the civil level were criticized for not being able to keep people in line, and base leaders were criticized for not keeping unneeded personnel on base during the riot. There were calls for the two sides to talk to each other more. It was suggested to MacArthur that a series of talks and discussions could strengthen the weak link between the two allies. However, MacArthur said, it would make the situation seem more serious than it is, and there is no staff or facilities to support such a venture. Never forget that, as Supreme Leader, he is the one who should be held responsible for the lack of harmony between the allies. Things happened in MacArthur's home city and in the streets outside his office before, during, and after the Battle of Brisbane. There were more important things for General MacArthur than winning the war and gaining fame for himself. There were also many good results from the investigation. Some restrictions were dropped, making it easier to find entertainment, and soon the tensions went down.